Welcome back. In this unit, we are going to focus on something called atomic structure. And as you might expect, by looking at the background on this PowerPoint presentation, you are in for a history lesson. Democritus was one of the first people to think about the existence of an atom. He was a Greek philosopher. Notice that I underline the word think. So really what that's implying is that he had no experimental evidence, but he believed that matter was composed of these very tiny indivisible particles called atoms. Instead, he called them atomos, which means indivisible. As I mentioned, people thought that he was crazy because he had no experimental evidence to support these thoughts. This was really just a thought experiment. You might ask, what did he actually think about? Well, his idea was that if you took a piece of matter and divided it in half and divided that piece in half again and in half again and half again, you would eventually end up with a piece of matter that retains the same physical and chemical properties as the original sample. And this is why he coined the term atomos because it meant indivisible. John Dalton, on the other hand, was a little bit more respected, and notice the large time lapse in between. John Dalton was a meteorologist. The main thing that separated him from Democritus was that he had experimental evidence to support his theory. His theory had four major points, or what we call postulates. The first was that all elements are composed of individual particles called atoms. He also said that atoms of the same element are identical. The atoms of any one element are different from those of another. The third is that atoms of different elements mix or combine in whole number ratios. So for example, when you make water, oxygen combines with hydrogen to form water in a two to one ratio. That's why it's called H2O. And the fourth was that chemical reactions occur when your atoms separate, join, or rearrange. And in a chemical reaction, atoms of one element will never change into another. Once we said, okay, atoms exist, we then had to dig a little bit deeper to understand more parts that make up these atoms. So if you think about it, um, with Democritus and Dalton, both said that atoms were indivisible. Well, guess what? The cathode tube experiment came along and that helped us to discover that the atom was actually made up of more pieces than we thought. So the cathode tube experiment, we had an inert gas, which means just a gas that doesn't react and it had two plates, a positive and a negative. The particles in the gas were attracted to the positive plate. Therefore, we were able to see that J.J. Thompson was able to con conclude that these particles must have a negative charge because we know that opposites attract, positive attracts negative. As you might expect, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. From his experimental evidence, he believed that the atom was a solid positive sphere with electrons shoved in the sides of it. His model was said to resemble a popular English dessert called plum pudding, and so his model was deemed the plum pudding model. Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford helped us to learn a little bit more about the atom by using the gold foil experiment. He used this experiment to discover the nucleus. To do this, he shot a high energy beam of alpha particles into gold foil. And you may say, what are alpha particles? Alpha particles are really helium nuclei where the electrons have been stripped away. This is an example of what his setup looked like. So you have a radioactive source inside a lead box that has a hole in it. And these particles, these alpha particles shot into gold foil. And then this zinc um, sulfide coated screen is where you saw the alpha particles where they went when they went through the gold foil. This is an example of what Rutherford observed when he saw the alpha particles go through the gold foil. So based off of the 
experimental evidence that these scientists had up until this point, they expected that most of the alpha particles, if not really all of them, would go straight through the gold foil. Well, there were some interesting findings. So yes, the majority of particles went straight through the gold foil. However, some were deflected and then some were would rebound in the exact direction it came from. And so what did this mean for our atom? Well, it had some pretty significant meanings for us. First, since the alpha particles went straight through, Rutherford was able to conclude that the atom is mostly empty space. Since a few of the particles were deflected at small angles, he was able to conclude that the alpha particle came close to something small and positive. You may wonder what that comes from because you may think, what do you mean positive? Well, alpha particles are positively charged because as I mentioned, they're helium nuclei that have electrons pulled away from them. And so because we saw the deflection, it must mean since like charges will repel, that thing in the center of the atom then must be positively charged. And finally, on rare occasion, as I mentioned, those some particles would bounce back in the exact direction that they came from. And so what that meant is that the alpha particles had to be hitting against something that's very small, incredibly dense, and a positively charged center, which we now know as the nucleus. We're not gonna go into the experiments that led to the discovery of the proton, but Goldstein is typically credited with the discovery of the proton. At times, I have seen um, people also crediting Rutherford, but for our purposes, we'll say Goldstein is credited with that. And then finally, James Chadwick is responsible for discovering the neutron. As you might expect, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, not all of Dalton's postulates were correct. We now know that atoms are indeed divisible. Atoms can be broken down into their subatomic particles, such as protons, neutrons, and electrons. And these two can be broken down even further. Have you ever heard of a quark? We also know that not all atoms of the same element are identical. There are something called isotopes that exist for different elements, and we'll talk about this later on. Let's get down to the nitty gritty, some of the properties of these subatomic particles. For the proton, it has the symbol P plus, the charge is one plus, and the relative mass is one. The neutron has a symbol N, the charge is zero because it's neutral, the relative mass is one. The electron has an E minus as its symbol, the charge is minus one, and the relative mass is very teeny tiny with comparison to the proton to the neutron. It's one over 1840. What that really means is that it takes 1840 electrons to equal the mass of one proton or one neutron. It's pretty incredible when you think about it because it has such a small mass, but the charge magnitude is the same for the proton, it's just opposite. The protons, as we discussed, are located in the nucleus. The neutrons are also in the nucleus. And the electrons are in the electron cloud outside of the nucleus arranged in energy levels. Atoms are considered neutral. And so what that means is when an atom is neutral, it means that it has the same number of positive things equal to the same number of negative things. So the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons. Hopefully this video was helpful in teaching you a little bit about the history of the atom and getting some of the foundations associated with atomic structure. Thank you so much for watching. You did a great job today.